Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. 50 years ago, Nashville was fairly homogenous, but since the 1970s, after a large number of Kurdish refugees made the city their home, we've become increasingly more diverse. Between 2000 and 2012, immigrants accounted for three-fifths of the city's population's growth. And now, at least one in six residents was born in another country. According to a 2017 article in The Tennessean, more than 140 languages are spoken in metro schools. The Nashville Public Library's collections include books and materials in over 19 languages. And Nashville now has the largest Kurdish population in the United States. Immigrants and refugees are an essential part of Middle Tennessee. As we've seen this week during This is Nashville's International Week, whether it's through food, dance, or public service, non-Native members of our community contribute greatly to our city's culture. And the relationship between New Americans and Nashville is reciprocal. Today, we look at the many ways immigrants and refugees add to the fabric of our community and how the community empowers them with the tools that they need to, to, to succeed. And it's your turn to talk because we want to hear from you. What's your story about coming to this country and Nashville? And what was it like for you to leave your home country? How has your life in Nashville been enriched by immigrant culture? Is it the food, the art, or is it something else? You can call us at 615-760-2000 to join the conversation. All right. Here with me now are Kathy Carrillo, the Director of Community Engagement with the Metro Human Relations Commission, and Max Rykoff, Director of Development for the Nashville International Center for Empowerment, or NICE. Good to see you both. Thanks for being here. Really great to have you. Okay, we got your mics on. All right, so we're going to start with this. Max, terminology we want to talk about. What is the difference between a refugee and an immigrant? That's a good question because in the U.S. immigration system, the word refugee is a very specific type of immigrant. So generally, a refugee is somebody who has a well-founded fear of persecution, who has had to flee their home due to war, disaster, persecution, violence. Immigrants are those who sometimes choose to leave their home countries for many different reasons, for pursuit of better jobs or education or whatever. In the U.S., the word refugee uh, refers to a protected class of humanitarian immigrants. And I should give a little bit of background. So the U.S. obviously has been a nation of immigrants for a very long time, and we have accepted refugees for a very long time. And formally, we started doing this in 1980 under the U.S. Uh, Refugee Admissions Act. So this starts with actually with the United Nations. Around the world, there is over 120 million people displaced from their homes. Mm. A lot of those people are internally displaced within their home countries because of violence and war and persecution. About 30 million of those are living in United Nations-run refugee camps. And the U.S. and other countries have a process where if refugees are not able to integrate into a second country after fleeing their home country. They will be living in a U.N.-run refugee camp, and then there are offices that the U.S. has around the world where they will start interviewing people for a process called refugee resettlement. And this is a process that takes, on average, of interviews and vetting with international agencies and Department of Homeland Security for about two years. Mm -hmm. And every year, the President of the United States, this is a process that's happened uninterrupted since 1980, tells Congress, we're going to let X amount of refugees in. And then Congress approves. And then this is run. This is a program run through the U.S. US Department of State. The U.S. Department of State contracts with organizations like NICE and Catholic Charities and Inspiritus, the other two refugee resettlement agencies. And these are federal programs to let this relatively small group of, of immigrants, of refugees, into the country each year. And there's a, a process for them to become citizens eventually. It is a pathway towards permanent residence in the United States. How about how many people were on that list this year? So... This year, the, the federal fiscal year just ended for 2024, and the new one just started. For last year, 
President Biden's um, number was 125,000. Mm-hmm. Is that unusually high or? It's, it's relatively high, yes. Almost never do we actually get to that number. So I believe the U.S. resettled about 80,000 people of refugees in fiscal year 2024. Okay. All right. So why is it important to make that distinction between a refugee and an immigrant? So it's a very specific subgroup of immigrants that, that we work with at NICE and other refugee resettlement agencies work with. This has been a the ethos of the United States to welcome those who are fleeing persecution for a very, very long time. And the U.S. has historically had the largest refugee resettlement program in the world, and I believe we are committed to continuing that. We welcome those who need our help. There is constant war and disaster going on around the world. It's like a disaster zone perpetually that we live in on this planet. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fundamental to this country that we welcome those who are facing specific fear and persecution and violence. I do want to ask about another term, migrants. That's a really charged term. We hear it on the news when they talk about migrants coming in from other countries, and it's used kind of vehemently in the political discourse. Is there a distinction between migrants, refugees, and, immig- and immigrants? So migrant is more of a general term. It's not really a, a term that's used in our immigration system at all. And I think it is sometimes used as a, a charged term, right? You, you, you say migrants and you conjure up this image of tens of thousands of people crossing borders, mm-hmm. and that's not what refugees are in the U.S. immigration system use of the, of the word. People move. Uh, one of our partner organizations, the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition, has a great T-shirt that says "People move." They do. We we all move. We're all migrants in some way, but uh, it's not a it's not a very specific term. And we we like to be specific because we work within the, the the structure of the federal government, and we want people to understand the different categories of of immigrants because it is an incredibly charged and tumultuous and divisive time uh, in the U.S. We want people to understand what's actually going on. And we want to hear from you. So call us up at 615-760-2000 to talk about your experience. Are you a person who was born in a different country? How did you make Nashville your home? What was it like for you to leave your home country? Or if you are an, an American, a naturally born American, what was it like? What, how has the immigrant community enriched the culture of Nashville? And what has your experience been? We want to hear from you. 615-760-2000. That's 615-760-2000. Now we've got Kathy Carrillo. She is with the Human Metro Human Relations Commission. Kathy, tell me a little bit about the commission. Give me a little bit a sense of its history and why it's here. Yeah, absolutely. So the Metro Human Relations Commission uh, was established in 1965, uh, specifically when there were a lot of racial tensions happening in Nashville. Um, At the moment, uh, at that moment, there was um, Executive Director Moore, who was an African-American man, um, and Fred Cloud, who was a a white man. um, And a black and white man decided to take this task on to talk about the issues at the racial issues and the inequities that were happening in our city. Um, And since then, it's developed. I mean, uh, this coming year, we're celebrating our 60th anniversary as a department uh, and the importance of the work that we do in Title VI and discrimination and addressing equity issues in the city. Um, And part of that is talking about how our city has evolved and is Nashville really welcoming to all of the residents that work, play, and live here. Um, And I think that's one of the reasons why this work was so appealing to me was because um, not only am I a Metro employee, not only am I a Nashville native, but I'm also a Peruvian American. I'm a first generation Peruvian American. Mm -hmm. My parents came to the U.S., went to Miami, didn't like Miami. I could have been a Miami girl. Okay. Um, (laughs) Didn't like Miami and specifically chose Nashville as their home. Um, And so when we talk about inequities in the city, when we talk about uh, how we address equality and equity issues, um, the MHRC is there to 
research, to talk about it, um, and to highlight the spaces where our city can and should do better. I'm a little curious. What did your parents tell you about Nashville that was so appealing to them? One of the first things that they mention when they talk about Nashville um, is the trees, is this green space. Um, They fell in love with the nature aspect of it. I grew up fishing. I grew up uh, going uh, to different um, campgrounds. I grew up uh, visiting Gatlinburg and um, I grew up on construction sites. And Mm. so I have quite literally seen Nashville grow and develop right before my eyes. And I think that they um, came to a a proven community that was already somewhat established. Um, And so they had other people that supported them that were from their country, that knew their culture, um, and that could guide them with what they needed to know about this new land and this new language and all of these new opportunities. You are the director of community engagement at the MHRC. Tell me a little bit about your role and what you do. Yeah, so I get to uh, I get to talk to people every day about um, where our city is and the sense of equity. Uh, a lot of the main focus that I have has to do with language access um, and whether you have an interpreter or whether you uh, have documents that are translated. I also get to be at the forefront of all the issues uh, when it comes to policies. I get to watch my coworkers, Ashley and Daniel, and my executive director, Davy Tucker. Um, face what it means to make sure that there is good policy in our city, that money is being distributed equitably, that resources are being distributed equitably, that we're talking about how policy can harm the people that live in the city. And are we creating good policy that truly makes sure that this city is something that we can all participate in, not just the wealthy few or the people who can do um, things during the day, but how are we opening the doors to make sure all of Nashville can have a say. All right. Thank you so much. We got a call. We got Jessica in Ashland City. Jessica, thank you for calling. What is your comment or question? I think that living in a city like Nashville is so amazing because we have such a rich restaurant culture and so much incredible food here. And the immigrant population in Nashville is what I think sets us apart from other cities in the South. Like you can go to Ethiopia, Lebanon, India, all, you know, for three meals a day. So it's pretty amazing. What part, what restaurants, what places do you love frequenting? One of my favorites is uh, Gojo Ethiopian restaurant. I just love that place. And I always go there with my friends and it's just the best. There's something for everybody and it's a flavor explosion. So that's awesome. That's really awesome. Okay. So how long have you, are you a native Nashvilleian? How long have you lived in Ashland, Ashland city? I'm not a native Nashvilleian. I've lived here off and on for about 15 years, and I'm actually a chef in town, so I really appreciate uh, all of the flavors and, you know, the different techniques that different cultures bring to the city. Awesome. Thank you so much for calling. Really appreciate it, Jessica. Okay, so you, you both heard that. The, food, the scene is growing. This place is growing a lot. The food scene is growing. We did an episode yesterday about some first-generation American foods, um, international foods that are done here. The impact of of immigrants and refugees on Nashville is a lot more than just the restaurant scene. It's a wonderful way to emerge and introduce oneself to a culture, but there's a lot more that is offered. What are some things that we may be missing because we're kind of going through our lives as we normally do that we may not see that the immigrant and refugee community highlight and bring to us. Max? Well, I'd like to talk about a program that we have at NICE that has opened up a lot of people's worlds, and that's a family mentorship program. So when we bring families over to to Nashville, pick them up at the airport, find them their first homes or first jobs, and try to orient them to the culture, but we cannot do that work alone. There is so much that is new. People are coming from a different universe sometimes. Mm -hmm. People have been living in a refugee camp for 20 years. Shopping for food is completely different. Getting mail, all these things that we take for granted. So we have a program. We partner our uh, refugee families with American families or sometimes immigrant families from their own community. But one of the most beautiful things that I get to see in my job and that we do at NICE is those relationships that form between a Nashvillean family, and a new American family. The, they become like extended family with each other. It opens up their worldview. They get to welcome someone in from 
an entirely different culture. And yes, they're teaching them things and tutoring them and showing them around the city. But the hospitality that I've seen, especially from our uh, our Afghan allies who came to Nashville in the in the wake of the the Taliban takeover, every time the mentor family would go over to their home, they would be cooking for them and welcoming them and giving them tea. And that to me is the the best of America. Those kind of relationships, that kindness from both sides, and the division and the cultural barriers just go away when we're all simply human with each other. I, I think that's just so beautiful. All right. Well put. Thank you for that. All right. We got Cindy. Cindy from Centennial Park. Cindy, thanks for calling. What do you want to share with us? Well, hello. I am the um, Celebrate Nashville Festival organizer, and we are in the park today um, plotting out spaces and getting ready for everyone to come out on Saturday. Um, and I just want to... Um, you know, so say thank you to a lot of people who make this festival happen every year because I think it is um, such a gem. Um, all Metro Council members who supported it, Metro Parks, um, Centennial Park Conservancy, our advisory committee, um, but also the participants. I think sometimes with um, Nashville gems, they go away, and you're like, "Hey, what happened to that to that thing, um, that event, that um, you know, that mainstay?" And um, I just don't want us to take Celebrate Nashville for granted. Um, so that means just, you know, please everyone come out and just be, be aware how special this is and how fortunate we are to have a city that supports um, a celebration of diversity in our communities. Well, Cindy, I really appreciate you taking time from setting up because you guys have a lot of work to do to talk with us. What can people, what are people going to experience when they come out this weekend to Celebrate Nashville? Well, first of all, it's going to be a beautiful day, so we are very hey. fortunate that the weather is cooperating. Um, you're going to walk. Uh, there's free parking in HCA. You're not going to be able to drive into the park, um, but there we will have shuttles going back and forth from the HCA parking lot uh, accessible off Park Plaza. If you go to our website at celebratenashville.org, all the information is there with the stage lineups, the craft vendors, the food vendors. Um, it's just going to be a lot of color, a lot of organized chaos. Uh, you're going to see, you know, lots of um, uh, costumes and or traditional wear from all over the world. Uh, people are going to be speaking different languages. We have a World Bazaar area with imported and handcrafted items, also nonprofits like Nate, um, who I just heard Max talking, um, talking about their services they can offer to our community. Um, we have the most food vendors we've ever had this year. We have over 40 food vendors um, with Bosnian food. We have Kurdish food this year. We have every empanada imaginable under the sun. Um, we have our teens area is run by the International Teen Outreach Program through Oasis Center, and they program an entire area all on their own. Um, so that's very unique and special. Kidsville. Uh, from under the Conservancy, we'll be managing our children's area, and that's going to be so much fun. Um, and then our stages, five stages, with performers that are primarily from the Nashville, Middle Tennessee area. So it's going to be going from 10 to 6, so come early, stay for lunch, eat dinner. There's something for everyone from 0 to 100, um, and we can't wait to see everyone. Yes, 0 to 100 is indeed. <laughs> one, one last question for you, Cindy. I know you're going to be very busy making sure that everything <laughs> runs smoothly. But tell me the one thing that you're going to make sure you don't miss on Saturday. You know, I take a break every year to walk my daughter and spend just at least 10 minutes with her um, to do whatever she wants to do, whether that's she looks at the performers and chooses an act that she really wants to see. She's nine years old, um, and that's my, my gift to us, um, mother, daughter, you know, so, so that I get to have that moment too with my child to make sure that, you know, um, she's, she settles over. There's a lot of child care. Thank you to all the child care um, people out there who are watching my kid during this. Um, mm. But it's, you know, we, um, when she was very small, I, I will never forget this. Um, there is a, instead of a sandbox, they have a corn box, which is much cleaner. <laughs> um, but she went over to play in the, box and it just struck me she was very little and she was playing with someone that didn't look like her and that was such a profound moment of connection for her at a very young age it was 
simple but complex as you build on that throughout the years. Um, so just, you know, that's my favorite time is just to, it's, it's just she gets to select whatever 10 minutes of music that we break away to go see. And we just, you know, hold hands and, and, and just get to be mom and da- daughter for a minute. So um, looking forward to that special time with her. That's really wonderful. We're looking forward to experiencing the day on Saturday. Cindy, thank you so much for giving us a call. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right. Have a good one. Okay, y'all, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to invite another guest to talk about the economic strength and cultural richness our local immigrant community brings. You can call us up at 615-760-2000. That's 615-760-2000 because it's your turn to talk. Stay with us. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for PrEP and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. Today, we're discussing the immigrant and refugees community that helped make Nashville a more diverse and culturally rich city. And we want to hear your thoughts, ideas, and questions about the international diversity that is growing in our town. You can call us up at 615-760-2000 to join the conversation. Call and answer one of the following questions. How has your life in Nashville been enriched by immigrant culture? Is it the food, the art, or is it something else? And as an immigrant, has it been difficult to maintain a connection with your own culture and heritage while also trying to assimilate into this city? You can call us up again at 615-760-2000. Now I'd like to welcome my next guest, Jorge Zatina, is a member of the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition, or TURC. Jorge, thank you so much for being with us. Welcome to the show. No, thank you so much for having me today, and I will be happy to to get some uh, info from our organization as well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're definitely going to hit that. Kathy Carrillo and Max Rykoff are still with us. Thank you both again for being here. Now, Jose, you came, Jorge, pardon me, you came here to Middle Tennessee in 2003. Tell That's me correct. this. Why did you pick Nashville as your new home? Well, uh, at first, I... I was uh, moving from Mexico to come here to the States, but uh, we have some family in Franklin. And uh, they invite us to see uh, if we can come over here and if we can fit. And, and if, if the thing that we was like uh, to, we are looking in, in the area. So uh, I wish I can move to New York before. So okay. but that was crazy. But when I get here uh, in Nashville, uh, we drove and I see Nashville was a click and then we drove to Franklin and we fell in love. So as uh, Kathy say, uh, we came here in September. So by that time in 2003 was a star built chill. So not as warm like this September, this past September, that was cold at that, yeah. that time. And we came from the Caribbean. Okay. So you can imagine that was cold for us. Yes. But it was amazing to see the Tennessee, the color uh, and then uh, I don't know, was something beautiful and then see this small town, like a, a classic movie town, mm. Franklin. So, and we fell in love and we just stay here. And then eventually with the time, with the work, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we see Frank, uh, Nashville as a, a huge opportunity to, to grow and, and, and my kids, they love it too. And they, they, I mean, they was growing here. You've lived in different parts of the world throughout your life. Yes. <laughs> and Nashville stands out above all of them, huh? It is. I mean, I, I've been here for 22 years right now. So, and uh, I don't know, it's like, uh, I feel that we can do so much here. And then I see so many doors open uh, that we can fit. And also, uh, I, I mean, for, for me in my personal opinion was I was really welcome uh, to to the area so the people that I met in that in that time uh, they make my life uh, I mean of course uh, sometimes we have ups and downs no mm-hmm. but uh, but that time I mean the people was super 
super helpful. So uh, uh, how we can connect my kids to the school, so how we can get to the to the health departments to to get the vaccination shards, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and we don't know nothing about it. Uh, and these people help me to navigate in 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 those areas. And and that's why then uh, I, I, I was thinking to do something for the new people that come into the States to, to learn or to help them to learn how can they navigate in the legal system, in the school system, in the health system, et cetera. So, and, and they, they don't feel overwhelmed with, I mean, we have so much strength. Of course, I, I did have that too in, in that time. Like, uh, and, and I was speaking English a little bit. So okay. by that time, it was so difficult to me to fit in the, Mm-hmm. in that area, but still like uh, we have a little bit overwhelming how tricky is, how we can manage jobs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But in the, in the big picture, so uh, the people welcome me really, yeah. really good. So, yeah. and, and so that, that being welcomed so open-heartedly and warmly by people in the community inspired you to start working with Turk. Exactly. Tell, me, tell me a little bit about what you do with Turk. Well, uh, with Turk, I just start like uh, uh, we have a business. Like I was the the cleaning business with my ex wife, and uh, and then uh, Turk they have a, a a group of people that is connected with them, the domestic service uh, workers, and uh, and they I get the invitation to to be part of that group, and I just as soon as I get the invitation, I just click yes. Yeah. So I wanna I wanna do something. And, uh, and and then I get connected with them and I start going to the meetings, I go to the conventions and see the job and the the multi faces, like uh, people from all around the world there. And that was like, a, wow, this is what I wanna do. So mm-hmm. I work with these people and, and learn, learn more what I can do. And then I start doing like uh, interpretations for them. And then I get connected with us at uh, the same time with, they, they connect me to Casa La Cultura, mm-hmm. and I start doing uh, like uh, uh, GED classes for the people and interpretation as well. And then I start volunteering more and more and more and get involved. And now they invite me to be the uh, uh, week advocates coordinator, so statewide. Okay. So, and it's kind of, and I was. Like when they say, hey, Jorge, can you do this? Yes. Yeah. Jorge, can you do this? Yes. I mean, I, I just open to, to do anything just to get connected and connected and connected with our communities. And, uh, and it's been so, so beautiful. I, I mean, it's a great experience to work for Turks as well. Yeah, that's wonderful. That worked wonderful. I, I'm interested in like some of the cultural enrichment and economic contributions that our immigrant and refugee communities bring. Kathy, tell me like, what traditions do immigrants or refugees bring here to Nashville, to our general community that really adds to the richness of our culture? Yeah, I mean, I think we've heard from listeners, obviously there's the food piece, right? Um, We have incredible restaurants. Um, I think even now we're seeing this incredible uptake in uh, Latinx musicians that are taking over Nashville, both in country um, and other genres. Um, And then professionally you have, I mean, Latinas are the leading folks who start businesses in the U.S., right? Um, And so every immigrant is contributing in their work and how they spend their money. Um, And I think more than anything, people forget that the decision to leave your country, the decision to leave your hometown, for whatever reason it may be, is a difficult one. And so when you come here and you arrive here, you make this place your home and you bring with you those values. Mm -hmm. And those values are family. Those values are unity. Those values are community. I, there was a young man who got lost in Smyrna. Um, And when I tell you hundreds of strangers saw a local news feed and went to go look for him just because it's one of our own. It's one of our, community members. And those are the values that we bring here. It, it, there's a saying that my dad used to say, it's like, hoy por ti, mañana por mi. It's like, today I will help you and tomorrow I know you will help me. And I think that that's the environment that Jorge is talking about too. That like when we arrive here, there are so many spaces and places where we can find 
other immigrants who have come, who have maybe figured a couple of things out and are ready to share with each other. And not only that, but we're welcoming with our culture. We want you to ask questions. We want you to taste the food. We want you to ask us about our traditions because we're excited to share that with you, right? And I think that Celebrate Nashville is one of those examples. Um, you get the opportunity to visit and know, learn more about all these different cultures, but it's also about spending time outside of this downtown core and understanding our neighboring communities. Um, and like you have Madison that is like 67% people of color. You have Antioch that is like, the center and hub of all kinds of different cultures. There are other communities outside of downtown center who are now not just wanting to share our cultures, but now are asking for our needs to be met as well. Mm. Right. And, um, and, and that piece is the important piece too, is we will share with you. And now that you know us and you've met us, we hope that you will stand with us in asking and advocating for the things that our communities need to like language access, like sidewalks, uh, like more money for our education. I mean, it, it is as simple as understanding um, like when you go to from one community center to a different community center or from one library to another library, the vast difference in aesthetic, the vast difference mm -hmm. in resources and space. Um, we need to start moving as a city towards equity for all of our communities so that we have more opportunities to talk to each other and learn more about each other. I do want to talk about those resources and equity mm. resources that are available to people, but I want to let everyone know that if you're tuning in, this <laughs> is Nashville, and I'm your host, Kali Olekolona. We're talking this hour about the immigrant and refugee communities and how they help make our city a very, very diverse and wonderful place. We want to hear from you, so call us up, 615-760-2000, 615-760-2000. So, you know, Max, you work with NICE, and you all help resettle people from all over the world. And, you know, like, kind of even like 10 years ago, this city looked very different than where it is now. Is there a certain area of town where a majority of people coming there are from a different country? So our office is located in South Nashville, pretty close to Plaza Mariachi, right off Nolensville. And that is like the enclave of immigrant communities. We have historically resettled people in South Nashville, but we're now going out further and further out <laughs> in Madison. We actually had opened up a second office in Gallatin, Tennessee, in Sumner County last year. But we're getting folks now in Smyrna and, and Laverne and all over. But South Nashville is still that heart and core of of the refugee community, especially. And we, we resettle people from Democratic Republic of Congo, from South Sudan, from Somalia, from from Myanmar, from Vietnam, from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq. So it's incredibly diverse. And now more and more refugees are actually coming in from Venezuela and Guatemala and Central America. And now actually Mexican uh, refugees are actually going to be coming into um, the U.S. because there is a new refugee processing center that has been opened up in Guatemala in the past year. Okay. Historically, refugees come from... Uh, the Eastern Hemisphere. Now, for the first time in the Western Hemisphere, there's a refugee processing center mm. just to provide more pathways to to come to the U.S. with uh, particular immigration statuses. I got to go to a break real quick, but I guess you do this work and you're dedicated. How'd you come into it? So my family came to the U.S. as refugees from the Soviet Union. We came to Birmingham, Alabama in 1993 mm. after the fall of the Soviet Union from Tashkent, Uzbekistan. So the Soviet Union um, broke apart. There was lots of ethnic and political strife going on with all those Central American countries. So my family was welcomed by the Jewish community as refugees uh, in the early 90s. So it's something that's deeply meaningful to me personally. How did your parents, what did your parents tell you about how the community accepted them when you first got here? So we came at a time where there was waves of immigration from the former Soviet Union. So we grew up in this little Russian community, which was so beautiful. The kids would put on plays together. There was the elders in the community who would teach us Pushkin's poetry and things like that. And the Jewish community was incredibly, incredibly welcoming to us. And it was difficult. It was a significant, significant culture shock for my parents who did not want to leave in the slightest their homes. And everything was completely different. Culture was different. Um, food, everything was different. But one thing that, um, Kathy, you said is, I found in my own immigrant community and the ones that I get to work with and, and see every day how community-oriented 
they are. And America is a very individualistic society, of course. Mm -hmm. We get to work uh, at NICE. There's like 40 different cultures represented in our staff. It's amazing to see that, the the richness and the community-oriented um, the mindset. And it's so full. And we, we always encourage employers, hire as many immigrants and refugees as you can. Your workplace is going to be much more fun to come to. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to take one more break. When we come back, we'll learn about some of the support services available for immigrants and refugees here in Nashville. You can call us 615-760-2000, 615-760-2000. We'll be right back. Khalil Lake Alona, and this is Nashville. We've been discussing immigrant and refugee communities here in Nashville and Middle Tennessee. And for many people who are new to a country, there can be barriers that make it difficult to move forward before they come settled into their new home. We've discussed some of those challenges on the show before. Language barriers, cultural differences, simply the pace of life can be hard to get used to. So how is Nashville supporting the people who come here from a new country? We're going to ask my guests, but we also want to hear from you. If you're an immigrant or a refugee, please call us to answer how were you supported when you first arrived here? What is your story about coming to Middle Tennessee? And what was it like for you to leave your home country? You can call us at 615-760-2000 to answer that question or to share your stories. And my guests are Kathy Carrillo with Metro Human Relations Commission, Max Rykoff with NICE, and Jorge Zatina with Turk, again, thanks to you all. Now, something that's been on my mind is thinking about communities. We talk, I don't know how many times we use the word community on This Is Nashville, mm -hmm. but if we had a nickel for every time we said the word community on this show, we wouldn't need to do a fun drive at WPLN. <laughs> now, I'm also thinking about the nature of our country and how people are forced to assimilate. And I'm gonna ask all of this and I will hear from all three of you. Do you feel from your personal experience and the people that you work with that immigrant and refugee communities are accepted in Nashville versus being appreciated here in Nashville? Because to me, there's a distinct difference between the two. Anyone can start. I think both, So, but they still like, a probably by, by areas or by groups. So, and, and, but in the, in the big picture, I think that is, is both, but they don't want to talk about it. They don't mm -hmm. want to accept that. So they, they, they needed the immigrants because the labor force or mm -hmm. because what they, they bring and, and the immigrants, because Kathy pointed, so we came here and we tried to we 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 was struggling in our countries, mm -hmm. so we 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 are looking for a better place to stay and and grow. So and we make home the places that we we get there, and we work hard. And we 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 wasn't thinking like a, oh my color or I don't think about nothing but work and and survive mm -hmm. and do something better for 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 my family and for the for the town that I live with, and then uh, and, and 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 give something for what I half in my background to this community. And then uh, I see in in my jobs, I see the, the appreciation, I see the, the people that like to work together with the with the immigrants and and people that they like to learn about our culture, about our language and and our food, uh, everything. They wanna learn. But as at the same point I think that people they don't they don't want to accept it openly, like mm -hmm. oh, I want to keep this low, low key, and so like yeah, you, I like you, and I, I need you, and I want you, but uh, uh. everyone doesn't have to know about it. Exactly, yes, and and that's kind of my point. We live in Nashville; it is a growing, diverse city, 
but it's st- people live in a segregated manner yes. when you think about it. There's certain neighborhoods where you can expect. I think about, you know, obviously it's it, we can't it's almost we can't compare apples to apples when we're talking about Nashville versus Manhattan and New York City. They have hubs where people go for work, for entertainment and what have you. So yeah. people mix together, even in Los Angeles. But Nashville, folks tend to unless they got to go to another part of town for the store or employment, tend to stay in their neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods tend to stay fairly segregated out here. How can the people of Nashville, Americans who were born here in Nashville, how can we be inspired not only to accept immigrant and refugee communities when they come here, but to appreciate them? So I think about that question of appreciation and acceptance through the lens of the role of institutions and systems. So anyone obviously can go enjoy immigrant restaurant. That's all wonderful and good. When we think about the the life trajectory of immigrants and refugees, and then being able to move freely and enjoy, you know, the joy of uh, owning a home and being able to move, uh, freely move around, employers and institutions play a huge role in that and removing barriers. That I'm, I don't know if you talked this week about the Our State Our Languages campaign to get the driver's license test in Tennessee expanded into more languages than just the five because there are immigrant refugees who go to Texas and Kentucky to take the test in Arabic, which for some reason it's not offered uh, here. And there's been a great campaign to to move, uh, to try to advocate for that change. But also the demographics of Nashville are changing significantly or and are going to continue to change significantly. And one of our first jobs at NICE is to find jobs for our community members and there are companies who, you know, tout diversity. It's a very good thing, obviously. But in order to really have a diverse workforce and to set people up for success, employers do need to invest in things like on-site English language classes mm-hmm. and child care and providing transportation and addressing the barriers that refugees and immigrants really have to being able to advance in their careers like everyone else should have the opportunity to. So... When I think about acceptance and appreciation, there has to be investment as well. Mm-hmm. Kathy. I, th- I think Jorge has a, a point when he talks about like our immigrant community is needed because of the labor force. And so I think in that sense, we are accepted. Um, to your question, I'm a Nashville native. So every piece of this county is my home. I don't just... I grew up in Madison and I'm proud of Madison, but I love Antioch. I love Bellevue. I love the downtown corridor, as problematic as it can be. (laughs) I love East Nashville. I love all places of what Nashville encompasses. And I think that that's what we need as Americans, as Nashville natives, is to, when we move into acceptance, start accepting our neighbors. They are not invaders. They are not people here wanting to change anything. They're people here who are neighbors, who are making their homes here. And that piece is so important. I mean, I think we we look at it when we, I'm so glad you brought up the campaign. Um, that's a federal requirement. The federal requirement is to be able to provide interpretation and translation. If you are an agency or department that receives federal funds, you mm-hmm. should have interpreters and, trans, and translated documents. That's the work that we do at the MHRC. I'm ready to be able to talk about the data and how we keep talking about being a welcoming city and what are the actions that we're taking towards actually being that welcoming city for all. We need to stop, you know, this... Um, rhetoric that folks are coming and that they're others. They are us. We are them. But kind of along with your point, you know, the political rhetoric, particularly in this general election, mm-hmm. immigration has been a big issue. And some of the rhetoric can be a little bit vitriolic. How do, how does the, the political nature of immigration, how does that cause difficulties in the jobs that you all are trying to do? It makes me have to explain why someone deserves to be treated as a human. That is not what Nashville is about. I think the conversations that we're having to have nowadays for you to see me as equal, for you to see my family as equal, um, the fact that we're blaming systemic issues, corporate greed, 
um, and true crisis of lack of resources um, and equitable distribution on a group of people is ridiculous to me. I think it's othering and it makes people want to separate and segregate ourselves when in fact we should be talking about how this doesn't just affect immigrants, doesn't just affect white working class people. It affects us all. The decisions that are being made at the federal level, at the local level, affect us all. And it is not one group's fault. It is the fault of systemic inequality that we are now seeing and that othering stops us from creating true policy changes. Is Jorge. Oh yeah, I I want to talk about two two points in this, and I I agree with uh, with with Mark too. So this is two things that is happening. So uh, the institutions uh, we uh, they are I mean, it's the institution and the bureaucracy in all levels. So that's uh, making this also difficult. So in the force uh, or in the employees or the the companies, they. They just want to have uh, the force to to produce, to move the econ the economy uh, forward and beyond. Mm -hmm. But the the institutions are still in the 50 years ago, so standard. Like oh, I mean, I I mean, they are working with the with the with blinds, and they don't see the picture like a, where we need to go as a country, not as individuals. Mm -hmm. So uh, or, or or moving everybody in different strings to move the, 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 the country. And, and that's why, uh, and, and that caused fear in the immigrant communities or the refugees as well. Either if the refugees, they have the status to be legal here, but the fear that, that they can be accepted in full as a humans as well. So that make difficult to, to insert in the, in, in the city, in the community. And the institutions, they don't want to work that thing. And then the other thing that I want to say is like, uh, as an immigrants, we came here to work, mm -hmm. to make living. We don't, we don't think when we leave our countries, uh, we oh, I want to take over from this company or take over this job or no, we want to be part of that. We want to yeah. work together. So, and then that make another another uh, way. So that's why immigrants, uh, and we can talk about because we don't have the paperwork. So most yeah. people, they don't have the paperwork. Okay, I can do my small company or I can do, I can work myself. And you can see that now that uh, uh, the people, they are doing uh, more companies. They are more uh, small companies like a business, uh, like a family business, but they are thinking now to, to move the economy. So we, we don't want to stop here right now. And the other thing is like, uh, we, don't, we don't want to move over and over to another city, to another city, because the, the, the fear that we are living here every day. So when you wake up and, uh, oh, shoot, what about if I can get pulled over? What about if I, cannot, I, mean, I can get fired because they find out that I don't have the social security, something like that. Mm -hmm. So that fear in the community, uh, And that's is transmitted to the kids as well. So, but still, we have that fear, but that move us to to keep moving forward. I got I got about two minutes left. I do want to pose this, and Max, maybe you can take this one. What can what can Nashvilleans do? Middle Tennesseans and Nashvilleans who may not have a lot of experience and exposure to immigrant and refugee communities. What can what can they do to educate themselves and to give them experience? So then they can take one step closer to appreciating these humans who have come to move and live with us. Go to Celebrate Nashville this weekend. <laughs> Get involved with organizations like NICE and Turk, Metro Human Relations Commission, with Inspiritus, Catholic Charities. There are so many events around the city in Metro Nashville that feature these communities. We have a annual storytelling event for World Refugee Day in June. Unfortunately, it's already passed this year where people share their stories of coming to the U.S. and Nashville as refugees. Get involved and volunteer. Even if you don't have a lot of experience, you can add so much as being um, a resident of this country and having experience living here and sharing that experience with another human being. It's something that is utterly transformative to your life and you will never regret it. All right. And and just real quick, and we did say we we're going to talk about resources. So we've got a real quick minute to talk about the resources. Are the resources that the city is providing for the international community, 
Are they enough right now? I don't think they are. I think uh, the MHRC is working on a language access study that's going to highlight how much money is exactly going into language access services, where we are right now and where we should be as a city. And I am really excited that my colleagues are putting this together and that we're working on gathering input from other community organizations because this is important and the lack of resources is what affects us. A really quick stat that i like to point out is immigrant children are 50% more likely to have anxiety and depression mm. just because of not only what they're facing with their families, but also the lack of resources to the community. So that, that statistic has to do with how much we want to do better. Our kids are our future. Our, my parents came here because they wanted a better future for me. Each one of these people are here because they want a better future for their families. So um, I'm excited as Metro to be able to start addressing that and finding the solutions. Oh, I'm excited for this conversation. Really, I appreciate you all. Thank you for being here. I want to thank my guests, Kathy Carrillo with the Metro Human Relations Commission, Max Reichoff with Nashville International Center for Empowerment, or NICE, and Jorge Satina, who is with the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition or Turk. Again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville as a production of Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Mary Mancini. It was directed by Tasha A.F. Lemley. Our technical director and board operator is Liv Lombardi. Catherine Cece's was on the phone, but she had it easy this episode. Maybe not next Thursday. All right. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get good podcasts. And the conversation never ends here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram. Tell us what you want from the show by filling out our quick survey online. You can also call to leave us a message, 615-760-2500. We may use that message on air. This is Nashville. I'm Kaleo Colonna. We'll see you at Celebrate Nashville, everybody, and on Monday. Be good to each other.